Hey now, before we get into the review and breakdown of The Acolyte Episode 6, aka Teach slash Corrupt, spoilers, The Acolyte Episode 6, aka Teach Corrupt, had a heavy burden placed upon it in terms of maintaining the narrative intensity of the radical two-episode run we all just experienced, which featured some intense use of the dark side, eye-popping lightsaber duels, and arguably one of the most slick Sith reveals of all time. While Episode 6 didn't match the pace, flair, and awesome action of its predecessor, it still offered up one of the more well done and most character focused episodes to date. Not to mention some new possible legends lore to stew on that may reveal even more about Kamir's past, who he may be, who he may not be, and ultimately his true intentions now that we know he's a Jedi outcast, and possibly a Sith outcast as well. But more on that later in the eggs and references segment. I love this guy by the way. Both the character from top to bottom and Manny Jacinto for going ham with the role. Kamir, aka The Stranger, is just as good as it gets when it comes to Star Wars villains who at times feel like someone you want to root for, or at least understand their point of view and how it is guiding their choices even though they do evil deeds. Think Vader in some cases, Balin's skull, etc. Kamir is right up in that pantheon now thanks to a more character driven and dialogue heavy episode like this one. This episode really shined when Kamir and Osha were the focus, mostly thanks to Jacinto's masterful delivery of his character's lines and his ability to complement them with perfect mannerisms and other physical performance tricks he uses to bring this dude to life. One could see front and center how someone like Osha, as Obi-Wan once told Luke, could be seduced by the dark side like Anakin was by Palpatine. In Osha's case, we are talking both literal and figurative seduction. Kamir is essentially whispering dark side sweet nothings into her ear, and as we find out by the end when she chooses to trust herself and don the Cortosa's helmet, his messaging is working and you can't help but think it's due to how seductive he's being while delivering it. These two essentially have their first dance when he goads her to kill him and finish her mission. The tension, be it sexual or adversarial, was thicker than sea air that they were breathing and it was hard not to feel like he was making progress on her, both in terms of convincing her to join his cause, but also to possibly join him more intimately. While the ship probably won't happen, it's hard not to see how seductive Kamir can be when trying to sell his mantra of how the Force should be used. Solid stuff. Outside of watching Master Soul slip even further into emotional chaos and clearly go rogue with his order, the scenes with him and May are by far the low points of this episode. While Osha and Q revealed more about themselves and their past in their moments, we got almost no new information out of Soul and May. Dude is clearly broken from what he did and then failed to report back on Brendock, but we've known that, so having that mystery, one of the show's main threads, be put on pause fully was a bit disappointing, but it did allow for some perspective shifting among the four main leads that remain, which will undoubtedly be paid off on over the next two episodes. It just would have been nice to get a bit more reveal about Soul's inner turmoil, but it seems we are going to at least drag that into episode 7, which is seemingly like another flashback affair, but I hope it also touches on where Osha and Kamir are at before we hit the finale. If anything, Soul not being able to tell the Jedi he found a potential Sith, both due to bad comms and his emotions, it is becoming more clear how the Jedi Order at large had no idea about a possible Sith resurgence, not to mention the clear cover-up Vernestra is orchestrating from her end for reasons we don't fully know yet. One could argue this short episode tried to do too much because it also included a new thread involving Vernestra going out on a mission that is clearly personal to her, but again, I find her moments to be purposeful and meaningful to what will be revealed in the end, even if the character feels kind of lackluster due to how she's being portrayed. Her scenes with Mog also reinforce the idea that the Jedi will never fully know of this debacle because he is already trying to blame Soul for being the fallen Jedi and doesn't even consider other options. 
This could be the story the Order runs with, depending on how the final two episodes shake out. So the Jedi cover-up is as blatant as it gets, and makes so much sense when you factor in Vernestra's early hollow conversation with a senator warning her that Senator Rayencourt is looking to essentially investigate the Order because he doesn't trust the Jedi and people are being influenced by his message. These are the seeds for what goes down in the prequels right in front of our faces. The Senate already doesn't trust the Jedi. The Jedi don't trust the Senate. The Senate can influence the masses on how to feel about the Jedi, and the Jedi are actually doing shady things to protect their status quo. This is the hubris old man Luke effused about, friends, and we are seeing it play out in real time to set up their epic fall to close out the Clone Wars and Palp's ultimate plan. Vernestra knows more about the threat of the dark side than the rest, and it now may be becoming clear that she could possibly have a hand in the tipping of the scales as she has now been quoted saying twice. Unlike the other Jedi, she seems to know or feel something almost personal about this stranger. Kamir did say he was a Jedi from a real long time ago. Vernestra is well into her hundreds. He also said that his former master threw him away and scarred him. His scar definitely has light whip vibes, and we all know who just flexed that move in this episode. Now when asked if it was his Jedi master, he remained silent. So the scars could be from his Sith master if we believe that he is or was Sith at some point. Could be some lightning damage from, say, a, I don't know, Darth Tenebris? In talking with Connor from Beyond the Dune Sea, one could theorize that Kamir is twice the outcast, both from the Jedi Order and from his Sith Master. So if you factor in all the Kylo Ren music and the fact that Leslie Headland said that this is purposeful and will be paid off on, the music that is, couldn't it be argued that Kamir is the beginning of an order of Force outcasts like the Knights of Ren, who don't really get with either defined Order of the Force? What adds even more weight to this theory is the notion that the island we see him and Osha on is not Acto like many are guessing, but an important island from Legends called Bald Demnik, which is prominently featured in the Plagueis novel as a Sith base that Darth Tenebris and Plagueis used to mine Cortosis of all minerals, which we can clearly see present in Kamir's cave. If this is indeed Bald Demnik, it's nearly impossible not to speculate that Kamir is or once was an apprentice of Tenebris, possibly like the Legends character Venomous, who was cast aside by Tenebris for a new apprentice in Plagueis. Is he Venomous? Well, it would take a species change, so it would be better if he was just another apprentice, but it could be doable because of Legends and whatnot. Him being Darth Plagueis would warrant a bit more concern due to another species change, and one that is much more tied to George Lucas canon than Legends stories. So for me, personally, I'd like Kamir to be a new character altogether that ultimately gets taken out by the real Sith Master and his new apprentice for trying to take on his own acolyte or start his own order under their noses. Seeing DT show up at the end to squash this awesome character would be pretty brilliant. How about some top moments? We have to start with Lee Double J's performance as he masterfully showcases Soul's broken state of mind while trying to repair the comms. Without saying a single word, this human made me feel the weight of Soul's trauma over losing his Padawan and squad of Jedi, not to mention Osha. He looks so broken thanks to Lee's performance, and it sent a clear message that this Jedi is not okay and hasn't been okay since the Brendock fire. I'm not sure we've seen a Jedi this emotionally vulnerable since the night of Anakin's dark deeds, and I know we haven't seen an actor pull off this level of emotion in Star Wars, so it's definitely a standout moment. Up next, and it really could have been every scene featuring Kamir, but him explaining to Osha about the Jedi and how they regulate the Force and how it's used, in addition to their up close and personal chat about why she's not a Jedi, really stood out. Not only were the scenes acted well with informative dialogue, but we learned more about why Osha isn't a Jedi, her darkness, and how damn good Kamir is at seducing her to the dark side. Things got damn near sexual with that lightsaber, that's all I'm saying. Alright, eggs and references. Like previously mentioned, Kamir's Island is probably not Acto, these aren't Porgs people, but it definitely could be and probably is Baldemnik, which is prominently featured in the Plagueis novel. 
Just like we saw in this episode, this island had cortosis deposits, and from the legend's book, it is revealed that Darth Tenebris and Darth Plagueis came here to mine the ore for themselves. In fact, this is the island that Plagueis kills his master Tenebris on, so the Sith connections are super strong with this one and make perfect sense for why we are seeing it in this show and why Kamir is using it for his base. What's not clear is if Kamir was ever tied to these Dark Lords, specifically Tenebris, who could have been his master. We all know the Sith break the rule of two, so DT could have had multiple apprentices before he took on DP. To me, the only itchy outcome is if they make Kamir Darth Plagueis, because he is one Sith Lord that George Lucas himself had a hand in creating. So things could get brutal if his species and age are drastically changed for this series. If done right though, Kamir should be just another awesome dark side user in the Sith's quest to take over the galaxy in secret that is ultimately achieved by Sheev, or we will find him to be something new like the first Knight of Ren due to being an outcast of the Jedi and Sith. I can get behind that. Up next is the nod to Vernestra's hyperspace visions. Mog calls her out for getting sick during hyperspace, but from the High Republic novels, it's revealed that Vernestra actually has visions sometimes while in hyperspace, which is even more curious if applied to this show and her possible connection to Kamir, or at least her deeper understanding of a dark side threat that could tip the scales. Maybe she saw something en route to Kofar or even prior to that mission. Finally, and please prequel bros and sisters, don't kill me here, but I definitely got Anakin gets his Vader helmet vibes when Osha was putting on Kamir's mask. From the point of view shot to the first breaths in the helmet, it was hard not to think about poor Anakin's last few moments as himself before his mask was put on for the first time. Hey, thanks for watching. Please consider subbing to the channel or becoming a member by hitting the buttons and stuff below. While you're out there, Star Wars, and make sure to be nice to someone, because there's always time for Star Wars time, and if you listen to the Star Wars time show, the Force will be with you. Always. Always.